Let's have a prayer. You can deal with me. Precious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time that we have to set aside from the activities of the world and to come and meet you. And we know that you're here with us because you have said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And I thank you for your presence here today. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to retain the good truths that are being brought to us. And Father, help us to know what you would have us to do to improve our lives and to be fit and ready for your soon return. And I thank you so much for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's let's sing our little help theme song, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye your bodies holy acceptable to God, which is your service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. No man one and two. Amen. Well, this is my last time presenting on health. And so I'm going to try to wrap up a few of the, the basic eight laws of health that we haven't covered yet. One that is not actually listed, but is really a center of, of to the problem is stress. So we're going to just talk about stress and then go into the counter rest. Okay, so stress. The most common reason for doctor's visits in the United States today is related to fatigue, typically caused by emotional stress. Stress kills. Stress causes various kinds of cancer. Some examples of bad stress include experiencing relationship strain, ending a relationship, the death of a friend, a loved one, spouse, abuse or neglect, working in a high pressure job with never ending demand or deadlines, unaddressed mental or physical health conditions, divorce, financial difficulties, and that's just to name a few of the stressors that we face in our life today. Stress helps. It helps you meet your daily challenges and motivates you to reach your goals. Ultimately, it makes you smart, happier, and a healthier person. That's right, good stress is vital for a healthy life. But there's good stress, there's bad stress. Good stress is short term and it inspires and motivates you and it focuses your energy and it, it enhances performance. Right now I'm having a stress experience. I'm standing in front of all of you. You're all looking at me. And so that causes stress, don't you think? But it's a good stress because it makes me focus. And besides, all of those smiles that I see out there, that kind of relieves some of that stress too. So could you all give me some white teeth smiles? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at what is bad stress. Bad stress is the kind that wears you out, leaves you jittery, and is harmful to your health. Bad stress or distress can lead to anxiety, confusion, poor concentration, and decreased performance. 
bad stress can be short term, which would be called acute. It can also be long term, which would be called chronic. Acute stress doesn't take a heavy toll on your body. If you can find a way to quickly relax, quickly relieve the stress. However, chronic stress can take a heavy toll on your body. It can cause negative health effects like headache, insomnia, weight gain, anxiety, pain, and high blood pressure. Even cancer is caused by stress. Several years ago, I went to a health recovery center because I was studying health, because that is how I regained my health. So I went to a few of these as opportunity came. And I went out to the state of Washington. It's in the um, northwest part of the United States, in Washington state. And there was a health center being run by a man. His name was Dr. M. Dr. M, he had an amazing, uh, good results with cancer patients. So I was very interested. I'd heard of him. So I went out and I took his course. Three weeks, I stayed out there. And mostly I just did juice. And that's one of his main treatments. But during the treatment time, he had lectures. And during this one lecture, he talked about stress. And he said, you know, we can eat everything perfect. We can eat at the right time. We can wait between meals. We can consume the right amount of water. We can do all of the, the health laws, the, the sleep. Everything can be perfect. But if you have stress that you don't know how to control, you can still get sick. Even though you're doing everything else correct, stress is very powerful in the negative. He said a lady came to him and she had cancer. And she was a good Adventist lady. She believed in the health laws. She practiced them diligently. As soon as she found out she had cancer, she even tweaked them up even better. And yet the cancer wasn't being helped. It wasn't going away. Finally, after interviewing this lady, Dr. M asked, do you have any stress in your life? Oh, the lady began to cry. She said, oh, my children and my grandchildren. And she was so overwhelmed with burden and anxiety and he said that's where your stress is coming from we need to learn to trust god don't we we need to learn to come and lay our burdens at the feet of jesus best way to relieve stress is to let jesus take it from us let's go on here both good and bad stress result in your body releasing hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol and they trigger common signs of stress like butterflies in the stomach, a racing heart, sweaty palms. Ultimately, what dis distinguishes good stress from bad stress is how you react or feel about it, about the experience. So we're gonna look at a few things that we can do. How to reduce bad stress. First, you can identify the stressors in your life and develop healthy ways to deal with them. Like I just said, bring in all your cares to Jesus. Cast all your cares upon Jesus for he cares for you. That's just one way to deal with stress. Learn to manage your time more effectively and your stress level will go down. Do you know that when you race out the door at the last minute and you have, you have a deadline, you have an appointment, you have to be there and then you're racing through traffic and here in Kenya, I don't know how you'd ever make it on time if you don't leave a lot of extra time because you have a lot of traffic on the road. That causes stress. But do you know that kind of stress can be reduced greatly just by leaving early? That's all. Just set the alarm 15 minutes earlier. You can reduce your stress level. Something as simple as that. Except that there are events in your life that you can't control. Instead of stressing about what you can't control, focus on what you can control and how you react to the problem. Think positive thoughts. The, the song this morning was perfect. Think of the lilies and the paints from Steps to Christ. That's what we should be focusing on. There are storms on those beautiful bushes. We don't have to pay attention to those. We can focus our attention on what is good. Thinking about all the things you appreciate in your life, can change your perspective. And the rest of this presentation is going to touch on our perspective a lot. 
So stay healthy and fit. A well-balanced diet and staying active ensures that your body is better prepared to fight stress. Exercise relaxes the body and the mind. We talked about exercise. This is a benefit while improving your mood. In fact, physical exercise has been proven to play a key role in pre preventing and reducing the effects of stress. Another thing you can do is get a good night's sleep. Getting enough rest is important because it gives your body time to recover from stressful events and sets you up to fight new challenges each day. Stay healthy and fit. A well-balanced diet and staying active ensure that your body is better prepared to fight. And I think I just read part of that in another quote. Okay, attitude can greatly reduce stress. Here is, I think if there was one quote of Ellen White's that is my absolute favorite, it's this one. I have benefited so much from this quote. I memorized it almost 30 years ago, and it has been an active part of my life regularly. When I feel stress, when something happens and, and I don't know what to do about it, or something is negative in my life, or I'm having a pressure that I can't cope with, here is what I say to myself, above the distractions of the earth, he sits enthroned. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. So every day of my life, I have a God and you have a God. I have a God who cares for every minute of my life. Everything that touches me, he cares about it. And from from his throne, he's watching and he's orchestrating events that are just right for me. Even if they're negative, I have to be thankful for them because what are they doing? They're creating in me the, the conditions that are good for me so that my character can be fit for heaven. And that's what I want. That's what I pray for. So I would really recommend that you get some quotes like this and daily practice surrendering yourself to the plan of God. And his plan may be for you to run late because an accident ahead would be avoided if you were just five minutes late. It's a little stressful, but God is working all of these things out. This will help reduce our stress when we realize God's in control. Amen? So here's another favorite quote of mine that I have memorized also. The Father's presence in circle Christ and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world, for the blessing of the world. Everything that Christ went through was for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, Jesus' source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Whatever comes to him comes from the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. And I'm going to highlight that. Whatever comes to him comes from the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Nothing can touch him except by the Lord's permission. Nothing can touch you. Nothing could touch Christ except by the Lord's permission. He really is in control. If we are surrendering our lives to him, of course, we are his children. All, not just a few of them, but every one of them, all our sufferings, and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadnesses and griefs, all our persecutions and privations, in short, all things. We covered everything there. All things work together for good. All experiences and circumstances are God's workmen, whereby good is brought to us. So the negative and the positive, they're all God's workmen. And it's all designed, especially your heavenly father, to bring good to you, to strengthen you right where you need to be strengthened. Here's another quote from Testimonies for the Church. Afflictions, crosses, temptations, adversities, and our varied trials are God's workmen to refine us, sanctify us, and fit us for the heavenly garner. And in 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13, we read, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing 
happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And in John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. If you have stress, you do not have peace. But Jesus is giving us a little formula here to fight stress so that we can have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That will give us peace when we know that Jesus overcame this world. And he's standing right beside us and he's walking through it all with us. So rest is vital to health. Sleep is essential to maintaining a well-balanced mind and a healthy body. Sleep allows your body to renew itself, which aids in healing, in the healing process, and rest strengthens the immune system. Now, how much sleep is required for a healthy body? Typically, it's seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Early to bed makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Have you ever heard that? Okay, so that was by Benjamin Franklin. Now, early to bed and early to rise. That really is a very sound principle. We should seek God early, right? The, the Bible tells us, seek the Lord um, early. Count your blessings and fill your mind with gratitude and thanksgiving and repeat scripture verses at that time to help you focus your thoughts away from the day's troubles and onto the ultimate solution, which is God, correct? So studies show that two or more hours of screen time this computer, the television, monitors, your telephone, that's screen time. Two to three, two or more hours of screen time in the evening can seriously disrupt the melatonin surge needed to fall asleep. If you want to sleep well, stop. Maybe at six o'clock, I'd, I'd recommend maybe. Six o'clock, no more electronics. No more television, no more computer, no more cell phone, that screen time is sending signals to your brain and it's interrupting the melatonin surge that you need. So consider turning all of these devices off at least an hour before sleep, but two to three hours would be much better. Try reading a book or taking a bath or doing some other type of relaxing activity. And that's, that's found from the internet from Sutter Health. And Sleep Foundation, also from the internet, it says, how does technology affect sleep deprivation? Using devices tends to delay the time when you actually go to sleep, reducing the sleep duration. Technology affects the brain, stimulating your mind and making it harder to fall asleep. Sounds and blinking lights can cause unwanted awakenings when you're sleeping next to electronics. So if you're charging your cell phone, and somebody texts, and maybe you got it on silent, but still the light may come on. That light or the little beeping sounds, that will interrupt. But it's even more than this. Wireless radiation impacts sleep in several ways. Not just blinking and sounds, but wireless radiation. Research has shown that exposure to wireless radiation results in delayed entrance into the deep non-REM sleep, which is your restorative sleep, and decreases time spent in certain sleep stages. The blue light from screens has been shown to disrupt sleep cycles. So this screen, if you want to help yourself sleep, just reduce the time, stop a couple hours before you want to sleep and you will sleep better. So there is a, it's really important to have regularity. The body loves to eat at the same time, to get up in the morning at the same time. The body loves to go to bed at the same time, to have the same amount of time in bed. The body likes regularity. The importance of regularity in the time for eating and sleeping should not be overlooked. Since the work of building up the body takes place during the hours of sleep, it is essential, especially in youth, that sleep should be regular and abundant, and that's found in Heavenward Bound, page 230. Paragraph three. You know, there was a 
Okay. I wanted to tell you a little illustration and I had missed that opportunity. So there is a, there's a window of sleep that is really important. So at night, I, I heard this from Dr. Neil Medley. He's a um, neurologist and he's a Seventh-day Adventist. And he explained in his, in his seminars that if you can get in bed by 9.30 and turn the light out and be to sleep by 10, you know, give a half hour to just relax, go to sleep. From 10 to midnight is like magic, a magic two hours. <clears throat> In that period of time, your brain produces chemicals, hormones that restore the body and clean the body. And to simplify it, it's like when we go home from this building and if at 10 o'clock, the cleaners, the house cleepers come in here and they sweep the floors and they take out all the trash. So the cleaners and the repairers, they repair anything damaged, they organize. That hour between 10 and midnight, that two hours is when the body does that. It produces hormones and little housekeepers and trash collectors go through the whole body and they clean out cells and they, they sweep and they get everything neat and they, clean, they have these good restoration hormones that will repair things that need to be repaired. But do you know what happens at midnight? At midnight, all of that hormone production slows down. It's abundant between 10 and midnight, but from midnight on, it starts slowing down. So if you go to bed at midnight, you miss two vital hours of hormone and chemical production in your brain that help you to have the restoration you need. I thought that was really interesting. And there was a young man in the academy where my children were, and he heard this and he said, I'm going to test it. And so what he did was, because in the dorm room, it's really hard to study. There's so much noise at night. And everybody's up until they say lights out. And then they're still snickering and, and getting away with things and, and disruption. He said, OK, I can't study during those hours. I'm too distressed. So I'm going to go to sleep early. So he went to bed early. And he got up at 4 AM. And instead of studying between 8 and 10, he, went, he made sure he was in bed by 10. And then he'd get up at four and stay between four and six, and he'd be ready to go to breakfast. And his grades improved great. He was getting better sleep, and he was getting better retention of what he was studying because he paid attention to those two important sleep hours. So spiritually speaking, we can take rest, and we can look at it from a spiritual, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you, rest for your soul, but look at this verse, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye will find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you know Jesus wants to come alongside and lift that heavy load off of your shoulders? And he says, come and take my yoke. Because when we try to carry it alone, it's too much for us. We're not built to carry stress and the heavy load of anxiety and worry. In child guidance, it says, how sweet is rest after a proper amount of labor. So if you want to sleep good, make sure you're moving during the day. Don't sit at a desk all day. Get up and move. Sleep is nature's sweet restore. It invigorates the entire body or the tired body, and it prepares it for the next day's duties. Now we're going to look quickly at water. There's a book. It's called The Body's Many Cries for Water. I put the, uh, the little quote in the wrong place there. The Body's Many Cries for Water, and it's written by this man, and I don't think I would do justice um, trying to pronounce his name. You can see it right there. And he says in his book, you're not sick, you're thirsty. When you're thirsty, when you're dehydrated, there are many negative effects in your body that you might think, wow, I'm sick, but you're not. Think about this. Your muscles are over 75% water. Your blood is 82% water. Your brain is 76% water. Even your bones are 25% water. Our health is truly dependent on the quality and the quantity of water we drink. Your body uses water for cleansing and cooling the body and to maintain the proper chemical balance. 
You lose water when you perspire, when you breathe, and through the elimination, the waste elimination through the urine and the bowel. If you lose just 20% of your body's water, it could prove fatal. They would call it dehydration. If you pinch your skin, if you pinch a little bit, and if that skin stays up and doesn't recover quickly, that's a sign of dehydration. But I want to tell you that our bodies, our thirst re reflex is not sufficient to tell you how much water you need. Don't wait until you're just thirsty to drink. Make a determined effort to drink regularly. <clears throat> Here's why. They did an experiment with a treadmill, and they put athletes that were um, really in good shape. They were football players, and this was done and conducted in Dallas, um, Texas, and they put football players that were really fit, and they put them on treadmills. And they said, just run as fast and hard as you can. And they timed when they ran out of steam. And they gave them no water. Well, they didn't last too long. They ran out. Then the second phase, come back the next day. They're all fresh after a night's sleep. They put them on these treadmills. And then they put a bottle of water there. And they said, drink as often as you want, whenever you need to drink. Well, it improved their time, but not by a whole lot. Well, then they said, okay, now, the third day, they said, now, today, we're going to tell you how much you have to drink. You have to drink this much. So they put, you have to drink this much. Get that done. Now, you have to drink this much. And they just kept feeding them water and feeding, and the guys are running and running. Do you know that they had to stop the treadmills after a couple hours? Because these guys could just keep going and going and going. As long as they were giving themselves proper water, they went far longer than they could without water. Another quick example, two couples are out playing golf. Do you have golf here in Kenya? Okay, so they're out and you know, it can be hot out there and especially at the equator with this intense sun. And so two golf carts, two couples. On the back of each golf cart is a container of, of some kind of liquid that the people chose. So they have their hydration fluids. And the one couple is older than the other. And so they're going all day long, but the couple that's older seems to have stamina and energy. And the couple that's younger is running out. And so finally, the younger couple asks the other, what do you have in yours? You know, and they go, well, we just have water. You know, they just put water in theirs. Well, this couple put some kind of a, um, a pop with a sugar in it, thinking the sugar would stimulate, but the sugar did not do it. The water was the best hydration. And it helps the older couple to have endurance and stamina. So how much water should you drink a day? How much do you think? Well, two to three liters is what it says here. So that is correct. If you are of a bigger stature, you're going to go three, maybe four liters. If you're of a smaller stature, maybe two. But you have to drink every day. So the best liquid to hydrate our body is water. And here's a quote. And it's from Review and Herald, July 29. It says, never take tea, coffee, beer, wine, or any spiritus liquors. Water is the best liquid possible to cleanse the tissues. So here's a quote from Ministry of Healing. In health and in sickness, pure water is of heaven's choicest blessing. Its proper use promotes health. It is the beverage which God provided to quench the thirst of animals and man. Drunk freely, it helps to supply the necessities of the system and it assists nature to resist disease. So pure water, drink liberally. That's it right there. We got a good example. Use the water, taking it in because it's not keeping the shower on the wall. Your body needs water. Remember how much water your brain is in your tissues. We need water and water helps cleanse and it helps regulate chemicals and hormones in our body. So use water inside and liberally use water outside to cleanse away the cleansing process of perspiration that's on your skin and the dead cells. Now, John 7, 33 says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow living rivers of living water. So Jesus is the water of life. Amen. So we can draw closer to Jesus and have that living water. 
Now this, I'm going to just touch on <clears throat> with one slide, excuse me, <clears throat> benevolence. Do you know what benevolence is? It's giving to someone else. It's doing something, <clears throat> excuse me, doing something for someone else. But this quote is so powerful for our preparation for heaven. Three testimonies, 548 paragraph one says, constant self-denying benevolence is God's remedy for the cankering sins of selfishness and covetousness. God has arranged systematic benevolence to sustain his cause and relieve the necessities of the suffering and the needy. We heard a lot this morning about the tithe and what it is used for. Systematic benevolence is the, the act of giving to others. And if when you give to others, you are, you are actually choking out the sin of covetousness because you're systematically giving to others and you're not allowing that selfishness, that selfish desire that I'm going to keep what I have. No, you give liberally of your time, of your means, and of your talents to the Lord. So I, I think that was just a really powerful quote for our preparation for heaven. Now we've talked about, in all these health talks, we've talked about nutrition and exercise and water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God, and a place in the United States at the Health Recovery Center named Weimar. They came up with an acronym to help you remember this. So NEW START is the acronym. If you take the N of the word NEW, that stands for nutrition. The E stands for exercise. The W stands for water. So that's NEW. Then START, the S is sunshine. The T is temperance. The A is air. The R is rest. And the T is trust in God. So if you're kind of evaluating yourself in a couple months, is there any area of health that I'm missing? Think of that acronym and it can help you. Okay, I'm having enough water and I'm having enough exercise. And so you can reevaluate your health program. Now we're going to end with the one that we haven't touched on yet, which is trusting God. And this will be our final subject. Trust in God. From four testimonies, we read strictly temperate habits in eating and drinking with firm trust in God will improve your physical, mental, and moral health. So all of these other things that we've been talking about, we have to have the element of trusting God because they, they are combined together to improve our health. Um, Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. Trust in the Lord, all of your cares. You have a great heavenly father. He is touched with a feeling of your infirmity and he will help you call upon him. Here's a quote that I really like, another one that I've memorized. Signs of the Times from July 14, 1881 says, nothing can happen in any part of the universe without the knowledge of him who is on the present. Not a single event in human life is unknown to our maker. No matter what you're struggling with today, your maker knows about it. But listen to this, while Satan is constantly devising evil, the Lord our God overrules all so that it will not harm his obedient, trusting children. We can trust in God when we're going through trials and when we're going through happy times. We can trust in God. He will not allow Satan to have full rule in our life. Every one of those darts of the, of the devil, if you'll turn to God, God will overrule them so that it won't harm you, but it will help you grow. Here's another quote that I love. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Everything that happens, all the places that God has led in our lives, he, he is the one that is creating the right path. And if we could just see what he's doing, if we could just understand the end from the beginning, then we would agree totally. Oh, is that what this is for? Oh, yes, yes, I will do this, yes. And so I think about that often. God has a plan, and I just need to get on board with what God has planned. From Desire of Ages, as we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through his word, angels will draw near, our minds will be strengthened, our characters will be elevated and refined. So draw near to the Heavenly Father. And that's a one very important aspect of our health. 
early writings says, those who receive the seal of a living God are protected in the time of trouble and are protected in trouble trouble must reflect the image of Jesus. So I'm going to read that because I messed it up. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. So let's, let's focus on that. If we focus on reflecting the image of Jesus fully, all of these other things will take care of themselves. We're going to draw closer to God. We're going to read his word. We're going to be changed by beholding him. And all of the attributes of Satan are just going to fall away. And look at Psalm 91. I'm not going to read it. You all know Psalm 91. It's a powerful passage for these end days, how we can trust God. So I have only two slides left. From Desire of Ages, page 331, paragraph 2. Those who take Christ at his word and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by his presence. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. To me, that means when I surrender to God, then I can be at rest, at peace. When I just say, okay, God, whatever the purpose is of this trial that I'm going through, I accept it. And then I can be at peace. Very quickly, I will say, in Ecuador, when I lived there, I was there eight years. I was kidnapped. I was wrapped with duct tape in the night, taken out of my bed. I was taken four and a half hours away. I was in that car, and I didn't know where I was going. Nobody knew where I was except three criminals that had kidnapped me. And I thought I was going to die that day. But in perfect acquiescence, there's perfect rest. And I started quoting these quotes. Above the distraction of the earth, he sits enthroned. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. Do you know what that meant to me? At that time, this morning, the morning before this happened, God knew it was coming. And he let it happen. It must be for my good. And when I struggled in the car and I finally reached that point, where I said, okay, God, I give in. I surrender to your plan. This is your plan for me. And if I die today, then I want to die ready for heaven. So I just started switching gears. Instead of fear and anxiety and telling God, oh, make them all have a heart attack or make me have, you know, the car have flat tires. Instead of trying to solve the problem myself and tell God how to do it, I surrender. God, if this is your plan, I surrender to it. In perfect acquiescence, there's perfect peace. If you want to read the next, the rest of the story, you go on Smyrna.org, go to the archives, to the old paths, starting back in November of last year. And in the youth section, all of the testimony of the kidnapping is there and you can get it right online. But we need to have that perfect peace that comes from surrender to what God is doing in our lives. The Lord says, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee, Isaiah 26, 3. This is a part that, that really hits me when I read it. Our lives may seem a tangle. And sometimes don't our lives seem like it's all tangled up. I don't know what to do. And there's this problem and this problem and this problem. And there are things that are so much bigger than I am. But our lives may seem a tangle. But as we commit ourselves to the wise master worker, he will bring out the pattern of life and character that will be to his own glory. And that character, which expresses the glory, character of Christ, will be received into the paradise of God. A renovated race shall walk with him in white, for they are worthy. And this is the last slide. And this is taken from letters and manuscripts. And this is what I want to say for my last thing to you. I want you to be safe. I want you to see Christ in his beauty. I want you to dwell with him through the ceaseless ages of eternity. I want to be there with you. But if you have heaven at last, you must be overcomers here. Free from every perverted appetite. You must fight the battle against every hurtful lust. Everyone who enters the city of God will enter it as a conqueror. 
He will not enter it as a condemned criminal, but as a son of God. And the welcome will be to everyone who shall enter the gates of the city of God. Come, be blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, it has been such a privilege for me to be here in this place in Kenya, meeting these lovely people, beautiful people. I'm so thankful that I have this privilege and to share on help. And Father, I pray that everything that I have said will be a benefit to these people here because I love them and I do want to be in heaven with them. And I thank you so much, Father, for what you're doing in each life here and in my life. Every day you're fitting us for eternity and you're preparing us for the things that are coming upon this earth. Things that will be very hard, very a struggle that we've never had before. Help us to practice today so that we will be ready when that time comes and that we will be overcomers and that we will be together with you for eternity. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.